CD-ROM software has generally been limited up until now to niche markets, businesses that need to access gigantic databases, users who want to work with multimedia resources. But the CD-ROM drive may soon become as ubiquitous as the old Apple II. For here at the Edison Montessori School, kids are playing with a new educational game from Sierra Online, Mixed Up Mother Goose, off a CD-ROM. From games to reference works to mainstream business applications, computer programs are increasingly being published on a compact disc. Today, we take a look at the newest in CD-ROM software on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by the Software Publishers Association, which reminds you it's a federal offense to copy software. The SBA provides information on how to stay software legal. Funding is also provided by PC Connection and Mac Connection, and by Byte Magazine and Bix. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffee, and with me this week is Tim Baharin of Creative Strategies. Hi. Tim, any user, of course, would like to have one of these lovely CD-ROMs right. with about 600 megabytes or so of information on it. But with this little mini changer here from Pioneer, I not only have one CD-ROM in here, I can put six CD-ROMs in here. Let me show you how this works. I slide this little cartridge right. into the, uh, the changer over here. And just through software, without having to touch right. this at all, I'll show you how we can go from one disk to the other. I'm calling up a program now called Computer Library. Right, the one from Ziff Davis. Exactly. And it'll take just a second or two. We'll see this thing. And there it is. It's coming up. Uh, I'm going to show you, and I have to wait for this to boot one more second, but as soon as this gets up here, I'll be able to just hit a couple keystrokes and get to yet another uh, 600 megabytes or so of information. Okay, we're out of uh, computer library. I'm now calling up Magazine Rack, uh, which is another program. We just heard the changer go here. The net result is six CD-ROMs in here. I can really access up to four gigabytes of information right, right through software, right. And, there's full, and there's the program already up there. Tim, I want to ask you, in the CD-ROM area, there's a lot of things going on to try to get this sure. working. One is this hardware-software tug-of-war in which the hardware guys are waiting for the software guys who are waiting for the hardware guys. What's your prediction as to what's going to happen with CD-ROMs? Well, anytime new technologies get out, there's kind of a chicken and egg syndrome, is that you need standards and some pricings to come together before it gets to the market. Uh, in this last year, we've solidified on the High Sierra standard from Microsoft, and the prices of the drives have gotten down to about $500. Consequently, we really believe that things are set in motion now to see CD-ROMs really start to to take off. Well, today, Tim, we're going to see several new CD-ROM applications, including an entire U.S. history course on a disc, a new CD-ROM version of Compton's Encyclopedia, a totally new way to enjoy music with a CD-ROM called the String Quartet. And if there were any doubts about the growth of CD-ROM software, those doubts should have disappeared at the recent Macworld Expo here in San Francisco. We begin with a report. CD-ROM vendors were out in abundance at the recent Macworld Exposition in San Francisco. And experts say 1991 may finally be the year of the CD-ROM. They point to a number of reasons. The prices have finally come down, and there's a lot of titles available, and that's really been the key thing. There hasn't been a wide enough selection of titles uh, to keep people uh, from feeling, if I buy this drive, am I going to be able to play more than one disc on it? Innovative titles were not in short supply at the expo. Everything from the Vietnam War to little-known facts about cows have been immortalized on the little discs. For the armchair traveler, Interoptica Publishing from Hong Kong has the interactive multimedia World of Travel. Combining sound and color, the disc takes you on a panoramic trip through the Orient. It comes complete with practical advice on etiquette and even voltage requirements. All sorts of animals come to life in the Dictionary of the Living World. This hypertext-based product is crammed with information on 5,000 animal families and species. Ever wondered what a rockhopper penguin sounds like? <laughs> but sound on the CD-ROM really comes to life with the Voyager Company's release of Igor Stravinsky's Rite of Spring. <laughs> Using hypertext, this disc explains the ballet score to listeners through about 300 link terms and some 2,500 play buttons. Users can browse through the disc's 1,200 cards just at a touch of the button. But while this CD-ROM requires only one megabyte of RAM, a major advantage of CD-ROMs is the amount of information they can store. CD-ROM is definitely here to stay, and uh, it would be pretty hard to get rid of it now. I mean, uh, we all had to hold our breath for a minute, but this year proves 
that uh, CD-ROM is not only here to stay, but it is the medium of the future. And when you can get as many as 1,200 megabytes uh, on one CD-ROM, which is the case of a new ROM called GigaROM, then you know it's here to stay and uh, the future is only up. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Maria Gabriel. One of the major application areas for CD-ROM software has been the education market, and here to show off two such programs are Larry Schiller, CEO at the Bureau of Electronic Publishing, and Jordan Sachs, Vice President with Britannica Software. Tim? Jordan, these products so far have mainly been sold to institutions, but they're becoming obviously more broad-based. How are we going to get these into the hands of the regular public? You're going to see more and more hardware manufacturers offering them through mass merchandisers, through direct mail, as we do now. There's over a thousand Tandy stores throughout the country now. Right. that have this capability to show you this equipment right now and, and the uh, contents. Larry, what about the price point though? Some of these things are $500 and no matter what you do, it's going to be hard for most people to buy a software title at that price. <laughs> Absolutely. We have seen many titles that are in that range and some even more expensive than that, but fortunately the trend has been towards titles coming way down in price. We have titles that, very popular titles for $395 down to $99. We even mm -hmm. see titles for $15 and $29 wow. now making it very affordable. All right, one of the things you have is U.S. history on a CD-ROM, mm -hmm. and tell us what that is. Sure. U.S. history on CD-ROM is a social, economic, uh, military, political, and scientific perspective on U.S. history right. from the 1600s to the present. It includes 107 books, and that's the full text from those books, all on a single CD-ROM with over 1,000 pictures, illustrations, and tables. Oh, show us how you would use this. Sure. There are several ways, actually, to get into it. What I'll uh, show you first is the contents, um, so your viewers can see an overall uh, concept of what those books are and, and the categories they're in. Let's take a look first to general histories. Right. And uh, there's the first book up there is A Century of Photographs. Let's just take a quick browse at that and scoot down here to, I think there's a photograph, right? There's a photograph here, yes, uh, Tim. And let's bring that up. In fact, it's a very well-known photograph, Matthew Brady's uh, a picture of Abraham Lincoln, which, which many of you have seen. So you brought in the text from all these books, plus mm -hmm. the graphics that were in the books. Exactly the right. Now this is black and white. What about color? Good. We have many, many color photographs. And uh, why don't we bring up flight here, and we'll again pull that up from our uh, main uh, contents category screen here. And there's flight from the Wright brothers to space. And let's bring up uh, some pictures that were taken by NASA here. We've got a particular book, I believe this uh, particular chapter, they all have photographs, but this one's got Saturn and its rings is a, really a breathtaking photo. It's in full color and, and mm -hmm. gives, you, gives you the concept sure. of almost being there. All right, can we take a look at that interface again? Sure. And uh, you've shown us one way to look for information here. How else can you, can you uh, one of the key values, I would think, of stuff on CD-ROM is you can, you can word search and term search and so on. Absolutely, and, and it's something you can't do with a book, but right. every single word, except for common words like and, of, the, are, is indexed. Uh -huh. Every single word in the database. We can uh, search, for example, if we would like to for mm. <clears throat> any word or phrase um, and exclude words if we like. Let's take a look at Saddam Hussein and see what uh, information we've got on, on that uh, colorful figure. Um, over here, and uh, we've got several chapters. In fact, we've got five hits, and I believe there's a quote in this particular chapter that uh, is, is pretty interesting. You can notice, by the way, that the, the words are highlighted the that we're searching for. Yeah. Uh, if we scoot down here, I think you can see the quote, uh, North purported to convey the president's, and that's President Reagan, of course, at the <coughs> time. This is from the, the Iran-Contra hearing's view of President Hussein. Saddam Hussein is an expletive, <laughs> is the quote. An accurate quote. All right, let me, let me ask you again what I was, was saying before the browsing. Suppose I just had one word and I can't find it in your table of contents. I want to know something about Alcatraz, for example. Okay. How could I do that with, with the browse command? Terrific. Let's go under browse. And we have, in fact, the ability to look up any particular word and see how many times it appears in the database. And here's Alcatraz. We see it does appear one time. Right. And if, if I, I wanted to get to that article, just hit just the enter key, and there it is. And uh, here's the information on Alcatraz. Terrific. Now, one last question. We're, we're demonstrating uh, U.S. history on CD-ROM on a PC right now. Is it available on a Mac? It is. And in fact, it's the same CD-ROM disk that works on both the PC and the Mac. You don't need a floppy. Both the Mac and PC software are present on the same disk. Jordan, I want to turn to you now. And yes, you have Compton's Encyclopedia you've just put out on a CD-ROM. The first question I have is, this is Britannica software doing this. Why did you put the Compton's on CD-ROM first rather than the Encyclopedia Britannica? I thought was that our initial market was going to be the schools. And Compton's is very well suited to the schools for lots of reasons, lots of illustrations, for example. Mm -hmm. So that okay. was our initial thrust. Can you show us what this interface is on Compton's? Okay, well, as you see, there are eight different entry paths. Let's just look at this one. Okay. It's called Title and Finder. Title Finder, right. And of course, you can, as you see, go through an alphabetical scan, pull it off the um, 
side here, or I can type in a subject. Okay. Sure. So you said, show me Mozart. And I'm going to show you Mozart, and the reason I want to show We've you Mozart... We've got a couple icons. We've got a, uh, a camera for pictures and an earphone for sound. Right, Tim. And it, so far, with the camera icon, we're going to see a picture. Everything we've done so far, you can do in any other encyclopedia. Right. But we thought it would be nice to know why Mozart's even in the Comptons. And so here's an excerpt. Uh huh. Yeah, we're actually listening to the score. Actually listening to the score, and we're taking it off the CD audio uh -huh. uh, quality disc. So this so. is a piece of Anna Klein Anak music, which right. is really why is. Mozart got into the encyclopedia yes. in the first place. Show and us what else you can do with sound here inside Compton's. All right. The sound in the Compton's covers everything from the music of the composers to uh -huh. famous speeches so it's not to just whale music. sounds. Yes. Well, give us an example. Okay. Well, let's go back and go to the U.S. History timeline. And this, this is very nice because, as you see, it starts in the very early founding, and here right. we can see all the events leading so up. this is like a big chronological map of history is the way it the is. interface is. But, it is. but then you can actually go on to, like, in this case, Kennedy's speech or information and then go back exactly, to that information Tim. and these are, hear it. Yes, these are all hot spots up here, and here's Kennedy's speech, which actually today is very appropriate. The devotion. Now, which we, we can then go into the article, see the pictures. Right. And we'll as you notice down at the bottom here, we've also hit some of the highlights of the Kennedy the administration. Yeah, about how many pieces of sound are there in the whole encyclopedia, do you know? There is 60 minutes of sound. Uh-huh, hmm. uh-huh. All right, show some of the other features. Sure. There, when you think in terms of how much sound you get on the average CD audio, yeah, we think yeah. we've done a pretty good job here. Um, some of the other features, of course, are World Atlas. Right. A, uh, one of the things that people like is the idea search, which is different than your normal Boolean algebra, in that I can ask it a question in normal language. Like, as in fact, a child might. Yes. You know. Why is the sky blue? Oh, or, uh -huh. uh, or you mentioned the atlas. How does that work? Yes. Well, let's look at uh, the atlas. And you see it's being drawn right on the screen. Oh. Now, I have two ways. I can zoom in, I can spin that, or I can go immediately to the place finder and find something so that a family is right up. Yeah. Boot it right up so the family wants to know what's happened there. And there we are. And you pull up that part of the globe. And I pull suppose up. I really wanted some text information to support okay. Baghdad. And I would just Iraq. click on Iraq, go to the article. You notice there's another map here. And I'm going to get a detailed map of that area. Uh huh. All right, terrific. Now, just give me an idea. We were talking price before. What do, what do these products cost? Jordan for the Comptons? $895, $895. Yeah, and U.S. History? U.S. History is available for both PC and the Mac, each is $395, and it's available in a bundle configuration, actually, for under $500 with a drive and several uh -huh. other titles. All right, Jordan, you have an article up here now on volcanoes, and I see a movie camera icon. What's that? That's animation, Stuart. So you have animation sequences. Oh, yes, 45 of them. Uh-huh. Well, what are these words that you have underlined, though? Well, every word in the text is hot as far as the dictionary definition, but these are special. They are glossary words, rocks. and they're pronounced. So there's a talking and dictionary on one of those words. Actually, All right, show yes. us the animation real quickly. Sure. Let's take a look at how a volcano works. And we just click on Go. And we see the oh, actual explosion. See the that's actual that's explosion. Great. At the end, of course, everything's explained. Uh -huh. Terrific. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Massive database capacity and the need for easy access are certainly the right criteria for a hospital computer system, so it's no surprise that the Stanford Health Library uses a CD-ROM product called the Health Reference Center. Here's a report from Palo Alto. Anything like that? No. Going to a doctor can be an intimidating experience for anyone. Nope. To help prepare for the visit, the Health Library in Palo Alto is fully stocked with medical books and reference journals. Supplementing that collection is a CD-ROM product called the Health Reference Center. Users can type in a specific medical condition and the CD-ROM will list pertinent articles and reference books. By tapping into the disease and medical condition guide, you can also get an overview of more than 300 medical topics. With hypertext, you can click on a highlighted term and get its definition. For more complicated conditions, users can get tips on prevention and even a list of questions to ask their doctor. Having all this information on the CD-ROM has been a boon for the library. There are many benefits for having it on a CD-ROM. For one thing, uh, CD-ROM uh, can be updated. Our CD-ROM for the uh, Health Resource Center is updated monthly. Uh, it also packs a lot of information uh, on the CD-ROM. You can get encyclopedias, you can get every 
so much on the CD-ROM. I don't think we've exceeded the capacity of it yet. <laughs> Furthermore, it's cheaper than an online service. The CD-ROM also contains information on subjects related to medicine. Medical fraud, for example, and um, or famous people in the field. And all of that, I find, or a lot of that, is picked up on, on the Health Reference Center. And that is immensely helpful to us. When we want the information, we need it now. And the CD-ROM supplies that. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Maria Gabriel. CD-ROM titles are coming out now for individual and small business users. Here to show a ZP4 is one example, Mike Gabrielson of Semaphore Corporation, and also with us, Stan Cornyn, president of Warner New Media. Tim? Mike, in some cases, this new CD-ROM technology allows you to have a much better and a deeper product. Uh, is it because of this CD-ROM that you were able to use uh, to, to do ZP4? That's right. Uh, the database is over 27 million address records that had hmm. to be compressed down to one CD, and only a CD would have that much capacity. So you wouldn't have done anything like this unless you had this medium. I mean, you don't have a magnetic floppy version of this, right? We do for small selected zip code ranges, uh, but only a CD could hold the data for the Not entire for country. Million. Yeah. Right. Now, that's an interesting product. Show us what ZP4 actually does, Mike. Well, the idea is that by finding a zip plus four codes for your mailing list, you can send mail with much less postage than usual. We have a interface here where in the first window is a list of all the states in the country. And by clicking on California, for example, the adjacent window immediately shows me a list of all the cities in right. California. Now I can scroll down and look for a given city. In this case, I'm going to use the pop-up menu to immediately jump to the S's. So we're looking for San Mateo, where we are right now. Okay. A lot of sands in California. Exactly. There There's is. San Mateo. I've selected San Mateo, and now the third window shows me all, all of the streets in San Mateo. Huh. Uh, in this case, instead of searching and scrolling, I'll just type Hillsdale Boulevard. Okay, which is where the studio is. Well, it turns out there's two Hillsdales, an East Hillsdale and a West Hillsdale Boulevard. I'll click on West Hillsdale Boulevard. The final window shows me a list of all the addresses on that street. I'll zoom open the window to the full screen. And we can see a list of the low and high, that is, the house number mm -hmm. ranges on that street. So, for example, 300 Hillsdale Boulevard, E indicates an even-numbered house, would be at zip 94403, and the zip plus 4 code is next to it, 4220. Uh -huh. I can search for an address, let's say 1700. Okay. That's at the end of the street. And sure enough, here is KCSM, right. the studio yeah. we're in, and it warrants enough mail to have its own unique zip plus uh -huh. 4 code. All right, now how would you actually use this? Well, if you have a mailing list on disk, you don't want to search for individual addresses exactly. for every address right. on your list. So we have a batch processing option under the file menu, where by selecting batch processing, I can select a text file on disk that I typically have already exported from FileMaker, Fourth Dimension, Helix, any sort of database program. I'll use these default options here, open that file, and now I'll output automatically by doing the lookups and finding the zip post four codes. I can output the finished list. And here we see it running through the address list, doing the lookups, mm -hmm. writing them out so to disk. 109 disc. records. 109 records. We automatically did 109 And you've already entered all those extra four digits into those. Right. Well. We've added the zip plus four codes. And your source here is the, is the Postal Service database? Right. We license the database from them. They maintain yeah. it. And we sort it, index it, compress it down onto the CD and onto the floppies. Mike, you see other applications like this kind of interesting, like a, a national phone book on a CD-ROM or something like that? Those, those exist. Uh, uh -huh. it's, it's any sort of directory product is very valuable when you have a lot of data you want to search through and have it at your fingertips. This doesn't have the names of the people, though. It just has the addresses. That's correct. The post office is only interested in getting the mail there, not to who's living yeah. there. Uh, and in many cases, in many of the street addresses, it's just the high and low house number, because sure. if you're in that range, that's enough to know the zip plus and four code. in terms code. of keeping the product viable, the names are going to change, I guess, faster than the streets. That's huh? correct. All right, we're going to turn to a totally different kind of product now, yeah. Stan. Uh, and yours is called the String Quartet. And tell us just a little bit about that. Well, we're starting off with the real essence of the five-inch CD, which you call a CD-ROM, but it was born for audio. Sure. And so we're giving uh, Mr. Beethoven, in this instance, uh, the best treatment we know how. I've often... Uh, had a great deal of envy for my friends who would go to, say, a string quartet, and they would get misty-eyed, and my mind would just drift <laughs> off. And so uh, I thought they knew something that I didn't know. 
Uh, and in fact, they did. So what we did is we gave Beethoven his chance for the music, but we have a screen up here, and we can do something we kind of think of as whispering for your eyes. So as this is, as Beethoven's going along, this is explaining to me right, in my I, eyes. I, I want to see this now, Stan. <laughs> All right, let's uh, go to Mr. Beethoven and let him start playing some music here. And here we hear the string quartet. We've chosen movement five. We could pick any place in movement five. Let's go, for example, to the scherzo. Jump there. We can access exactly where we want. Even by measure music. number. I Absolutely. Think, yeah. And we have various ways now that we can watch this. You can consider this like five video channels with the, that you can tune into as the music continues. Mm. The first more or less explains the uh, freshman approach to this, exploring the music. Uh -huh. The basics. Uh, absolutely. Then for more sophisticated, we can go to the structural analysis, or we can go to a harmonic analysis, which is what, what you might call video channel three. Now, this is describing the particular piece of music the moment we're hearing it. As it's happening. This so this is, is just really not generic background. No, sir. Okay. This is exactly in time to the music, yeah. uh, as if you could uh, appreciate note for note what's happening. Right. Sure. Now here we are in the, the blueprint, which shows you which each of the four instruments in the quartet is doing at mm. this point. For example, you can click on violin two, or via the viola at this point. It will say that it's in a figure mode. We can even click on an ornamental figure and have that explained to us. Mm. All right. Now, there's, besides the amplification of the music in its various spines, if we click on Mr. Beethoven's cheek there, we can find out what else there is in this program. And here we have a list of a background to classical music, uh, by and large. And we can click on something ca called Foundations here. And let's go down to Tempo, for example. And we have all the different tempos in the piece. And we can click on one. Let's call it Presto, an mm -hmm. illustration of the sure, tempo of Presto. There are uh, over 7,000 pages in this entire piece here. Just to give you an example, we can go to the index and show you the great depth of what we have listed uh, page after page. We'll go down here and uh, pick any one of these things. You can click on it and we'll take you there. Let's go to intervals, for example. Uh, and how we here, here we have a chapter of seven pages about intervals. We can click through these pages uh, and see the various different things we want to know about intervals here. Uh, here's, for example, Pythagoras. Let's go listen and see what Pythagoras has to say. I have long pondered the laws governing consonants yeah. and dissonance. Thus it was with great joy that I discovered sound. Can I interrupt Mr. Pythagoras here? Uh, well, please. We only have about a half a minute left. <laughs> sure. Uh, you have an exam, actually, sort of a musical exam built in here Indeed also? we do. Uh, let's go over there, and there's the final exam. And we'll give you a little test, see how hip you are today. To uh, Mr. I'm glad Beethoven. we're running out of time. Uh, right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, here's your first question about Schindler was Beethoven's friend and biographer. True or false? You got a 50 50 50 shot oh, on boy. this. Oh boy, well, I go for true. You go for true, let's yeah, see. I how always you pick do. heads. All right. Bravo, true. your answer is correct. <laughs> All right. There's several hundred questions yeah, left. Yeah, we, we, are, we are out of time. I think, All Tim, right. you had one question you want to get back to Mike on. Yeah, Mike, the reason that they have this product with the Zip 4 is that those four extra numbers really cut down the price, isn't it? Right, you can send mail for as little as 10.1 cents a piece. You can get uh, lower prices for postcards, nonprofit groups, 5.7 cents mm -hmm. each. It's great. Well, very different product, certainly, yeah. Tim, but great each in their own way. Gentlemen, thank you very much. That's our look at CD ROM software. Stay tuned now for this week's computer news. In the random access file this week, Apple Computer is trying to develop a new wireless network system. Apple has asked the FCC for permission to use radio waves to transmit data between computers. The new Data Personal Communication Service will use 40 megahertz bandwidth in the 1850 to 1990 megahertz band. The system will transmit data at high speeds over short distances up to about 100 feet. If the Federal Communications Commission approves, the data PCS could replace the use of wired LANs. If you're trying to decide between a desktop PC and a workstation, a California company may have a solution for you. Opus Systems has introduced an add-in board that turns any IBM-compatible PC into a powerful workstation. The board uses a Spark microprocessor and lets you toggle up and back between simple Word DOS tasks and more detailed engineering and design applications, which require the power of the Spark processor. Opus Systems says the new board should be available in April. 
Compaq Computer will soon begin offering software and hardware support for its products, even when they're being used with other vendor systems. Compaq will provide authorized dealers with staffing and training to sell multi-vendor solutions which use its products. Among the third-party vendors covered will be Novell, Microsoft, and Banyan. Compaq is also starting up a toll-free support line for its products starting March 4th. The number to call is 1-800-345-1518. Next up, Paul Schindler and this week's software review. Here is Word for Windows on a Macintosh. Here is WinWord 1.1 on a PC. A year ago, it had been much harder to tell the difference. Word for Windows 1.0 looked very Macintosh-like. Now it looks like Windows, and that's a substantial improvement in user-friendliness and usability. The biggest change in WinWord 1.1 is the addition of the ribbon, a sort of secondary ruler that enables you to see and control various word processing settings. Instead of pulling down a menu, you can click on a button. I'd like to see this feature in the Mac version. Of course, WinWord has all the standard features, including a spell checker and a thesaurus. It also includes a lot of embedded help in the program itself. Call up a help index. Ask for a tutorial. There is a wide range of choices to teach you more. Start with creating documents. All of them have an overview, practice, and summary, as well as an estimate of how many minutes it takes to complete the lesson. Word for Windows version 1.1 from Microsoft and Redmond, Washington costs $500, down from $700 for version 1.0. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Paul Schindler. Taking a look at this week's top 10 software titles for the Macintosh, Mac Connection reports that Macintosh Federal 1040 is in the number one position, with After Dark coming in second. Third is Mac Utilities, followed by Sam and Disk Doubler. Rounding out the top 10 titles are Suitcase 2, Correct Grammar, TurboTax 1990, Adobe Type Manager, and Microsoft Word. Tape-based answering machines may be moving one step closer to obsolescence with the introduction of a new talking chip. A company called Information Storage Devices recently introduced a microchip that can record and play back up to 20 seconds of speech. Unlike conventional chips, the ISD chip stores data in analog form and can maintain its memory for up to 10 years. Makers of the chip hope to fit it into airplanes, microwave ovens, and medical monitoring devices. Finally, a new program called the Complete Writer's Toolkit gives you a memory resident full dictionary, thesaurus, grammar checker, and style reference guide, abbreviation program, and a dictionary of quotations, all at the touch of a key. The Writer's Toolkit works with most popular word processor programs. Well, that's it for this week's Computer Chronicles. I'm Kate McGargie. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by the Software Publishers Association, which reminds you it's a federal offense to copy software. The SBA provides information on how to stay software legal. Funding is also provided by PC Connection and Mac Connection, and by Byte Magazine and Bix. For a transcript of this week's Computer Chronicles, send $4 to PTV Publications, Post Office Box 701, Kent, Ohio, 44240. Please indicate program date.